go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker, uh, David Johnson. Uh, throughout his professional career, David Johnson has been an educator, author, international photographer, and archaeologist. During the last 50 years, his international assignments have provided him the opportunity to experience a wide variety of cultures, religions, and environments which contributed to his holistic approach to developing a more in-depth understanding of the academic disciplines he is investigating. He has researched archaeology, archaeological sites throughout North America, Peru, Chile, Southern England, and Karnak, France. Ramsey. Let's see. He is he was awarded an honorary doctorate degree for his research is the National Geographic Research and Exploration Award recipient and his research documents the publications are preserved in the National Anthropological Archives Smith, Smith <coughs> Smithsonian Institute Washington DC and with that I'll have everybody turn off their video and their microphones, and we'll let uh, David take over. All right, I'm going to share screen. All right, Richard, I can see you, can you hear me? Oh, yes. All right, so we're ready to rock and roll? Yes. Wonderful. First of all, I want to thank you for having me uh, attend your meeting remotely, being able to speak to you. This is a great way to meet because otherwise we may never have met before. So uh, I really welcome this. And as you can see by the presentation, it's Native American sacred and ceremonial landscapes. And in this case, because of the Agave chapter and where it's located, I'm comparing ceremonial stone features from the southwest to the northeastern United States and their correlation to groundwater as well as each other in the three worlds. And before I begin, I want to say something about the stone features like you see in the picture here. Everything that Native Americans have out there that is part of their ancient ancestry, their cultural heritage, has multiple meetings. So every one of these stone features, petroglyphs, anything we see or find out there <clears throat> has spiritual meaning, cultural meaning, multiple layers uh, uh, of meanings, uh, clan meetings and uh, various others. So it's a very, very complex uh, system that needs to be looked at at multiple layers. I often say like we're, we're dealing with five dimensional chest. What I'm presenting today is another level to this that I came across about 23 years ago, quite by accident. I didn't expect it. I wasn't looking for it, but all of a sudden it appeared. And so let's get into this. And so this will help augment how to help understand the various features we find out there that are Native American archeological features. This research is based on... Okay. So you keep going? Yeah, keep going. <laughs> All right. So um, what we have here is we have both scientific and experimental research methodologies. And why I'm saying that, I'm going to explain briefly. <clears throat> First of all, um, where it says seismic and chemical analysis, uh, I was with the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and the Geoscience Department and Anthropology Department for about six years working with their staff in those fields on the research when it began, and it began actually in Peru. 
And during that time, we were using all the modern scientific equipment available to us to get the data. However, there were certain things about the data that we found that was quite amazing. And yet, we were looking at sites that were more than 2,000 or more years old. And being one of the lead scientists on this, I came to the, you know, the, the conclusion is that we're looking at it with all the modern tools available to science and we're tracking this particular characteristic um, related to these sites that are 2000 years old. But the natives who did that 2000 years ago did not have any of these tools to work with. How did they find what we were finding? Or how did they find it first? So one of the things I started to do and I encourage is doing experimental research with other methodologies that might have been available to the ancients that were not necessarily, uh, you know, that we may dismiss today. And one of them is dowsing. Now, if you asked me about dowsing 30 years ago and you said as a scientific person, would I be talking about it as using it? I'd say no. But when we got into this research, I started trying out dowsing to see if it helped me find some of the features that we were looking for in the geology and hydrology, and it did indeed work. And so I expanded that and used it as one of the components to solve the mysteries we were faced with. And it's only one component because we use all the other scientific information as well. Now, often when I say I use dowsing, a lot of the academic people turn right away from it and say, oh, you shouldn't use dowsing, it doesn't work, it's this and that. But true science keeps an open mind and tries everything. And I am always willing to have this tested by anyone at any time to go out, test on sites, and see whether it works or not on sites. And so far it has, and everyone who has tested it has joined in and started using it and agreeing that it is applicable to our research. One of the things that we, were, we had found is that Native American features are associated with concentrated flows within the groundwater. Now, this is important to understand this chart a little bit. Wherever you are listening to me, you have a water table under your feet, and that's showing down in between the, the green layers there of what I have labeled as bedrock. So you have a water table. That water table can be trapped at any numbers of layers of between uh, uh, impermeable bedrock beneath you. But then there are faults and fractures that are going through that bedrock and water in the water table or water seeping down through the bedrock or soils or alluvium can go into those faults and fractures and be conducted over distances within those features. And we call them areas of higher permeability or concentrated flows. And it's along those concentrated flows that we are documenting Native American structures, stone features, petroglyphs, petrographs, anything that dates before Columbus, before the Europeans get involved. And I'll explain it further as we go. And during this time, I've also worked a lot with various Native Americans. I've been with, for example, the Navajo out west quite a bit. I've worked with various uh, First uh, Nations in South America, in Peru and Chile. And I'm working with them out on the East Coast as well, the Linenap, the Inar area, the Sutina up in Canada. And <clears throat> What we find in there is you have the representation of the three worlds as shown in the left right side of this picture, the spiritual world, the present world, and the underworld. And one of the things that's related to all three of those worlds is the cycle of water. Water from the sky reaches the earth, it nourishes us, water seeps into the underworld, 
it's into the caves, into the bedrock fractures, eventually comes back up to the surface, goes to the sky, and you have this cycle of water. The person in the picture is one of the most famous traditional spiritual leaders in Peru. And I had the opportunity to go to, with him up to one of the most sacred lakes in Peru or in the West Coast of South America. And that's the lake that is showing in the center of the three pictures on the right. And at that lake, he did one of his most sacred ceremonies. And in it, he wanted me to hear how he relates the three worlds with Mother Earth, which they refer to down there as Pachimama, and water. And after recognizing the cardinal points, thanking Mother Earth for life, he then thanked Mother Earth and the spiritual present and underworld for the cycle of water. And he said, I give my heart to Mother Earth and the water it supplies us. And when he did that, he took his baton and made a motion. And by accident, I happened to catch it in, on my shot. And if you look at it, it forms a perfect half circle. He's giving his heart to the water that Pachimama provides. So I've also talked to many other First Nations about this. And they agree that the water in the three worlds is a critical part of their life cycle. And in addition to that, this is true in the ancient archaeology of South America. Now, in order to get to where we are in North America, we're going to start in the Nazca Lines. Now, I want you to look at that picture. That's a detail of some of the Nazca Lines. And when you look at them from the sky, they look like continuous lines because you're flying over them at about 1,500 to 2,000 feet. But I'm going to mention later and reinforce this. On the ground, those are dotted lines. They're actually done by stone piles. Now I'm going to explain this picture here and a couple of sequences of them. And what I'm explaining here applies to wherever we go. We can apply this to the Northeast, the Southwest, the Northwest, whatever direction you want to take it. And I'm explaining the site that one of the first sites I did was in Peru, and it was near Nazca, Peru. In 1996, I was invited to Nazca, Peru to help them look for additional water resources. I wasn't invited down there to look at the Nazca Lines because Nazca Peru is surrounded by the geoglyphs called the Nazca Lines. Even though I had interest in it, even though I have archeological interest in it, I went down there on behalf of geological hydrological studies to help them find additional wells for the community. And why? In this picture, look towards the bottom, and if you look over on the left side, you see Terras Blancas River by a, red, by a red dot with an L. That is the river that flows through Nazca. That picture was taken in July, and you'll notice what's missing in that river, no water. In this part of the Atacama Desert, they get so little water that the rivers are dry on the surface and basically down to 30, 40 feet with very, very limited water flow and uh, hardly any flow at all for nine months of the year. January, February into most of March, you can have water on the surface, but it's nothing like any river you would associate with. So Nazca is constantly looking for additional water resources if they want to develop and grow their community. So I was invited down there and I was drawn to this area. And you can see what kind of a desert it is, absolutely bleak outside of the river valley. When you look at this, look at uh, the base where it says ancient wells, Cantayo Pukio South, Cantayo Pukio North, these terms, Pukio, relate to wells in their local language. Ancient wells, 
that had been in use for over 2,000 years. Then go above the green fields, you see well sample 15, and right above it, it says cemetery and habitation site. Right there, there's the remains of a large 2,000 year old cemetery and habitation site. We know the people lived there. You can see the evidence. It's clear right on the surface and the ancient wells down there next to the river. Up until I got involved, people thought that the water in the ancient wells was coming from the river. But when I got down there and I looked at the ancient wells, the ancient wells, the water in them averaged about 12 feet to 14 feet deep, all right? The water table was about 14, 12 feet below surface. When you went and analyzed the water in the river during the dry season, the water was down 40, 45 feet deep. And right away, I questioned that. How could the water in the river be seeping up 40 feet to get in these ancient wells and have a steady flow rate? And when I made that realization, I immediately looked to that valley. And if you notice up in the upper left-hand corner, I'm pointing south. That is south of the Nazca River or the Terras Blancas, which is east-west. I looked at that dry valley up there and I began exploring it to see if there were any bedrock fractures or faults. And that's the foothills of the Andes Mountains where there could be water conducted in those faults and being conducted towards the valley, the main river valley through the side valley. So anything that you see that's a red line or maroon line up there, that's actually a fault or a fracture that is suitable for conducting a flow of water. Then in the center of that, where the lines tend towards the water samples in the cemetery, that's where water can pass through the alluvium, underground, under surface, but in the alluvium. After I mapped the faults, and I was alone when I was doing this in the first year, then I went and with dowsing rods, I followed the water the sources that I found there by walking back and forth, picking up on a water source and tracing it along its length and mapping it. So the blue lines are the water, concentrated water flows that I picked up. And when you look at them, you see how these flows, two in particular, come right down and intersect where the ancient wells are. The cemetery and the habitation site are right where these two sources of water churn into the river. Then we did water samples. On, and you can see water sample 15, 16, 17, 14. When we did the water samples, it showed that the water in those wells was coming from the south more than it was coming from the river at the time we did the water samples. So it indicated water was flowing from that side valley coming out of the bedrock through the alluvium coming down towards the river valley and then turning into it. And the ancients put their wells on those locations. They knew that those water sources flowed 365 days a year and gave them a source of reliable water where the river wouldn't. Now I'm gonna go one more. The next slide shows a yellow area squared off. Now I'm gonna show you what you can't see in that picture by zooming in within that yellow square. And this is what the ground surface looks like when you get close. And I'm sure you can see on the left, the spiro, on the right, another spiro, a broad line on each side going up through in zigzags. These are the Nazca lines that are located there. Now the next slide highlights those features and I highlighted them in green, yellow, and orange. And all of a sudden, what you realize when you do that, the ancients were mapping these underground water sources, these concentrated flows, 
where they were coming in from the side valleys into the river and using them as their most reliable source for potable water year round. And there's something else in that picture worth noting, because if you look at right up at the top of the picture, you see a term high spring. That spring is actually up on the ridge line, a thousand feet above the river valley. In that spring, we tested for several years. And every year, whatever season we went up there, there was water available there, fresh water, potable water, up there in the desert on the ridge line, indicating that water was passing through the bedrock at that location. So it was with this original breakthrough with this that I realized that the Nazca lines were associated with mapping underground water resources, concentrated flows, and associated with geological features like faults and fractures. So now, what I realized I had eventually was geometric hieroglyphics. Because these Nazca lines, although they're joined together like that, as you see it there, they actually consist of different geologic, um, geometrical features. The first one down there is a trapezoid. That's connected to a triangle, a triangle to a line. And when you follow it across the desert, and the mountains are behind us, incidentally, the mountains would be where you're sitting, traveling across the desert, you see where I've labeled Nazca Valley. And where those lines, those, uh, those features of the Nazca lines intersect the valley, that's where you find archeological sites in freshwater springs. And the freshwater springs are water from the sides, not from the river itself. So then I thought these symbols have to have some meaning. So I started relating each of the different uh, ge uh, uh, geometric features to various features I had in the geology and hydrology. And the first one I made a breakthrough was, was the trapezoid. And I came to realize that the trapezoids were always located right along the course of an underground flow of water. A concentrated flow is flowing right beneath that trapezoid. But then the question was, why a trapezoid? Narrow end, wide end. And after a while, and I got to work with some of the guys from uh, UMass and that, um, we got together one day and we said, we've got to solve this. And all of a sudden it came to us. And then we tested it during the wet season and dry season to see if it was true. And it was. The narrow end of the trapezoid represents the width of the flow in the alluvium during the dry season. The wide end represents the width of the flow in that alluvium during the wet season. So they not only were mapping the course of the concentrated flow, but they were also documenting its widths during dry season, wet season, basically determining its rates of flow. So once I had that information, then I started breaking down what does the spiral mean? What does the triangle mean? What does the long continuous line mean? And eventually I broke down numerous of these meanings so that we could actually start to read these features. And this is written up in the book I wrote on Beneath the Nazca Lines, and other coastal geographs of Peru and Chile. And we did 1,500 miles of desert, looking at hundreds and hundreds of sites and saw that this worked consistently. Now I mentioned the Nazca lines, when you fly over them, look like a line. When you get on the floor of the desert, it's a dotted line in most cases, a dotted line. And it made me think about something because back in New York state, I had run a, before I went to Peru, I had run an explorer post with scouting for 20 years. And we were constantly hiking in the Adirondacks, the Catskill Mountains, all through this area and trips into other parts. And when we did, 
one of the things we found every once in a while, lines of stone piles. And I never gave him much thought, even though I was involved with archaeology at the time. I didn't give him much thought until Nazca. And then when I came back, I was giving some programs and lectures on this. We had done some uh, peer review journals on that. And some of the people locally contacted me and said, David, are you aware of the stone piles right here in your backyard? And I says, yeah, and I got a test on them because could they be similar to what we found in Nazca? And the results was they were. The dotted lines of stone features that we find in areas around here that had not been disturbed are literally located along fault fractures or um, a natural bedrock fractures, which can conduct water and often lead you to freshwater springs. But not only did we find lines of stones doing that, we found paralleling lines of stones. So what you see here is a Karen on the right, Karen on the left. Then all along, right over the slope there, every 100 feet or every 50 feet, on each side, there's another stone pile, another stone pile, another stone pile. And what they're measuring is the trend of the flow, which way is it going, and the width of the flow, in this case, 30 feet wide. Up here, we have forest, lots of rolling hills, lots of vegetation. So they use a different way of doing it than down in Peru in the desert. They use stone piles, cairns, and other features. So we found we had the same thing happening here. And it became part of what we realized was the Native American sacred and ceremonial landscape. Because once I began talking to the local Native Americans up here in the New England area, they said, yeah, we've been talking about that since before the Europeans came. We've been saying that these features are part of our sacred and ceremonial landscape. And they need to be preserved. And unfortunately, they're not taken seriously by non-Native archaeologists. So during the last yeah, 15 years plus, I've been working with local Natives up here and across North America, trying to preserve these sites. Now, one of the important things about these sites, when you look at these stone features and you map them traditionally, you have a stone feature here, a stone feature there, another one over there, uh, artifact here, maybe a structure over there, and you try to relate how are they associated with each other. But one of the interesting things is when you map out the features of a site, this is a four acre site near where I live in New York. It has a habitation on it. It has various stone features on it and we map them out. Then we looked at the geology, hydrology, and, arc, and uh, the concentrated flows. And when we mapped the concentrated flows, they all connected all of the features on the site. The concentrated flows connect each feature. And what it turns out is no matter where you're standing, if you're standing by Karen 4 and somebody's over by large boulder number one, they're connected by the underground water, which the natives here often say are the pathways of our ancestors in the underworld. I have also heard this from some of the Western First Nations who have said the same thing. Now, eventually when I went to the West and I've done sites clear across from the Atlantic to Pacific, from Mexico all the way up to the to basically the Arctic Circle in Canada and Alaska. What we find is this is a site in Colorado. It has Dalton Paleo points on it with other structures leading up to Apache. It has several stone features, including perch rocks, stone circles, stone platforms, stone cairns, snake walls. When you look at it, they look scattered across the site. But when you add the concentrated flows, each of those features are connected. Now, what are we doing with this? 
Well, once we know that, we're using this to find sites and various features like stone features, petroglyphs that we are out of sight, that we may not be aware of, we can find easily by following the concentrated flows out from the site and it leads us to those features. We've done this consistently clear across the United States, Peru and Chile, and I've done it with sites even in England and France and other locations. But the point is it augments on how to analyze a site and see how things are related. In addition to that, I mentioned about the stone features. All right, so I'm gonna start with this image. I'm not going back to that, that stone pile shot. One of the things we find about the stone features is the similarity from site to site to site. And when you look at this tall cairn, this is in Spruceton, New York, about 30 miles from where I live. Notice the stone features that I pointed out there and notice its shape. And then you look at this one. This is one foot taller. It's located in the San Luis Valley in Colorado, over 2000 miles away. And look at the stone features. Now I'm gonna go one more and you're gonna see them side by side. Notice the top feature. You see like a beak with an opening in between. You go over on either side, you see the same feature go to the middle stone and you see a similarity in the middle stone. Go down towards the base, you see a similarity in those stones. It's as if the same person used the same schematic to construct both these cairns, yet they are located over 2,000 miles apart in two different environments, done in two to the, what we can determine two different historical periods by different Native American First Nations. And the one that was in Colorado had points at the base of it, which were archaic. So you see the similarity between the stone features and similar meetings. All of these tall stone cairns are along line of sight, along concentrated flows. We also find up here in the Northeast what's called U-shaped or crescent cairns. In this case, you can see it looks like a crescent of a moon. Before I got involved with this, people said, these features are always located on documented ancient Native American trails and that they're actually a trail marker. When I got involved, I found that these features are consistently located on concentrated flows along Native American trails that followed the concentrated flows. In other words, stacked right up on top of each other. The flow is here, the crescent cairn is there, and the trail passes right along it. When I went out west, what did we find? U-shaped crescent cairns. Out there, they called them heraduras, horseshoes. We didn't even realize we were talking about the same feature before I went out west. Because I said, do you have U-shaped crescent cairns? They said, no, when I got out there, I, we found this one. And they said, I says, that's a U-shaped crescent cairn. They said, no, we call it a heradura. So we had to organize our terminology and make sure we're using the same terms for common features. And in this case, that particular feature is just like the feature we have up here on Native American trails in the Northeast and is consistently located along Chaco roads. And these are common along Chaco roads, a common feature. And they're consistently on concentrated flows. And we have tested on numerous Chaco roads and the Chaco roads consistently follow concentrated flows. Turtle cairns, if you look at this one, you see on the left side, the head of the turtle, you can see the, like a leg with a flipper, it has a tail. This one's up by us. Part of the Algonquin, the Iroquois tribes, the turtle is a very important symbolic feature with them. 
When you go out west, you get the same thing. The turtle clan is very, very common. Turtle cairns up here are consistently on concentrated flows. And interestingly, we also determine the head of the turtle, the direction in which it turns left or right or straight ahead, tells you the direction the concentrated flow is turning or going. If you're on a trail and you're following the cairns, when you get to a turtle cairn and you look at the head, it will tell you whether to go straight to the left or to the right. When I got out west, here's another one, a turtle cairn in the San Luis Valley of Colorado. And you can see in this case, the head is over by the gentleman with the red shirt on, and you can see the head is looking up towards the sky. But again, the same characteristic. In this site, they said, we've got a site out there, see if you can find it. I went out, did the test, followed the flows, and it led me to the various features, and the turtle carrot is one of them. Snake walls, we've got snake walls up here. You can see the end of that snake wall over in the left side of the picture. It is not an enclosure. It's not something farmers built to enclose livestock or crops or keep animals from entering their crops. It is a mandarin wall and that large boulder is the head of the snake. And we have numerous snake walls out here. They always follow along the course of the concentrated flow. They flow right along it. We go out west, what did we find? This one's in Arizona, just south of Flagstaff in the Coconino Forest. This snake wall is 250 feet long. It's a rattlesnake wall because it has buttons on the far end. And I'm gonna show you the snake head in detail. When you look at that snake head, you can see the boulder that's placed in there has the shape of a rattlesnake head. And then I pointed out, you can see two fangs sticking up and you can see the ripple of the tongue that they worked into it to show the snake fangs out, tongue out. Again, common, common characteristics among very similar features that have specific correlations to concentrated flows in the underground and also have very special spiritual, tribal associations with the Native Americans, multi-layer meanings to them. Up here, we can have great mounds. Great Cairns, we call them. This one's 75 feet by 30 feet by 12 feet high. It's located on the steep slope of one of the Catskill Mountains at an elevation of over 2,000 feet. It extends along a very wide concentrated flow. What these large Great Cairns tend to mark are the widest and most significant concentrated flows associated to one of these sites. And then the other flows are either tributaries or branching from it. When we went out west, we got the same thing. San Luis Valley, this is a very large stone mound, 50 by 20 feet, but the height is obscured because a lot of sand and debris has drifted in here. But if you were to dig down on the margin of that, this particular stone feature would probably be five, six, seven feet tall. This feature is located on one of the most important sites along the trail from the Pueblos down by Albuquerque along the trail that led into the San Luis Valley where they migrated back and forth. It is surrounded by multiple other stone features including a, one of the largest crescent cairn I've ever seen. When you go and you study the Chaco culture, you find other great mounds, only there they're called earthworks or mounds. And you can see I outlined one there. Again, these features are located along the, the length, the, the trend of concentrated flows and in between structures, as if connecting the dots leading you from one place to another. 
short stone walls like this one. You can see the two arrows and it indicates that the length of this wall is 22 feet. What it is, is what I determined to be a width marker. It measures the width of the concentrated flow at that location. So if you approach this wall like you see it, and you go to the other side and continue straight, it will lead you to another Native American marker, structure, petroglyph, petrograph, stone cairn, Herodur, whatever is out there. When we went out west, we found the same thing, Colorado, Arizona, Agua Fria, it doesn't matter. We had them also out in Bly, California on the Bly geoglyphs. Short stone walls, not very high, which indicated the width of flows. The similarities are absolutely amazing. And what I've determined, and the other people are determining with me, this is literally a written language, which we now can read fairly substantially. Small circles. This is no teepee ring. This is located right near where I live. It's four feet in diameter, and it's located along a line of stones and surrounded by multiple other stone features like I've shown you. And in this case, these stone circles show an intersection of two flows where two flows are intersecting one another. When we got out west, we found the same thing. This is at La Plata, which is a site in Agua Fria National Monument, Arizona, south of Flagstaff, south of Sedona. And this is only five feet in diameter. This is not a teepee ring. This is incorporated into other stone features. And if this was a teepee ring, think how could you live within five feet, even if it was used by dogs? There's no other major teepee rings around it. It wasn't a habitation site. We don't find a lot of artifacts here, but we do find a lot of other stone features connecting with concentrated flows with evidence of either a fault or a bedrock fracture. Vertical stone slabs. They're like direction or pointers. Now I'm looking at it broadside, but if you looked at it along its length, it actually looks like the next one. So this one's in New York. This one is in Arizona, up by two gray hills, right on the border of Arizona and New Mexico. And you can see that vertical slab wedged in that bedrock fracture. And what it is, is actually a vertical marker up on top of a ridge line. And here you got this great flat expanse in front of you there. You look very, very carefully right off the tip of that stone. You look, you see a slight line, very slight, but you can see a line curving off across that grassy area. That's actually a Chaco Road. So as you're following the Chaco Road, you're coming to the ridge line, you look up, you see that pillar, it tells you where to go next on a concentrated flow. Out here, we have tripod rocks. This is a huge boulder. You can see it's one, two, three, four, five, six feet by eight feet in size, egg-shaped. And it's propped up on three small boulder stones. The front one, which is on the left side, is actually a quartz boulder. Quartzite and quartz are sacred to the natives of, up here in the Northeast. And it's a consistent marker we find of theirs. Geologists would say this is a glacier erratic. It was dropped in that position by receding, receding glaciers. But what we find, this is surrounded by other ceremonial stone markers of Native Americans and is actually propped up on the rocks. And when you look at these boulders closely underneath, or stones in this case, all right, the triangle actually gives you the direction of the course of the flow underneath it, the concentrated flow, and it tells you the direction the trail is going that you're to follow to keep you in line with the three worlds. We went out in Arizona, California, Montana, wherever we go. 
Midwest, we also find tripod boulders. This particular one is in Agua Fria again, just uh, south of Sedona, and it's propped on three smaller stones. In this case, it's not a glacier erratic because it was not affected by glaciation. And it is surrounded by other stone features and markers that you can follow like a dotted line if you know how to follow them. Now, what happens? Here you are on flat land and all of a sudden you come to cliffs, you come to a mountain slope. You can't build these stone cairns and stone piles on that type of a slope. So what's the solution for it? Well, petroglyphs, petrographs. And it took me a while to realize how simple this was because you're trying to make it complicated in your mind. How did, what are they trying to show us here? And it turns out like this. What is the base of a cairn or a stone pile shaped like? A circle. And what they did here, what it shows is they couldn't build the stone pile or the stone cairn on that ledge. So what they did is they took the symbolic symbol of it, the round base and made the circle on the stone features in petroglyphs or petrographs. Now what's interesting about that, when you measure the distance between those two circles, it equals the width of the concentrated flow. Now we've tested this both ways. They've put me up on top of the ridge line with the petroglyphs below and, 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 and asked me, where do you, what do you think's here? And I followed the concentrated flows to the edge of the cliff, could not see what was below me, marked off the width of the flow, said, this is the width of the flow, and down there on the cliff face, these are the type of features I expect to see and describe them. And by God, when we went down there and we looked at them, that's exactly what we saw. Now, what's also interesting about this, different stone circles in different locations have different designs. Now, this one is from the Palaki area down around Sedona, and it's a petro petrograph and Sinagua, we often, you know, they often call them shields, but whatever it is, it's still the circle. It's representing the base of a cairn, base of a stone circle, indicating there is a flow passing here. Then the cultural design is describing the First Nation, the Native American group that put it there with their cultural identity. In other areas, it's a simple sunburst, a circle with sun rays up in Colorado. And this is a very early one. We date this, we believe this goes back to archaic. This one is right near my home. It's up in the, in the uh, Catskill Mountains. And what you see is rays coming out. And when you connect the extended rays, they make a circle. No matter how you look at them, they're all a circle. That's the base indicating that it's representing a cairn, a stone pile, and that a flow is passing here. The pen is orientated north-south along that. We also find stone spirals, and the stone spirals represent snakes coiled. They often have, at the end, a snake-like head that is very recognizable. What happens when you get to a ledge? You can't put that stone feature on the ledge, so you put the stone spiral. The day we did this stone spiral, I was documenting that, and this was in Chaco Canyon. And I had another guy working with me, Brooks Marshall, who lives up in, uh, uh, by uh, Farmington. And he watched me do the spiro. And I knew that there was a concentrated flow coming out there. And he thought about it. And I looked at him and I said, what'd you see that I didn't see? And he says, I don't want to say it yet. Let's see what else you find. And this one was straight down. 
Then we went over to another area where there were petroglyphs, found another spiral, but the spiral had an extended line coming out at a 40 degree angle. And that's exactly where I was tracing the concentrated flow out from the wall. And I hadn't looked at that line. And then Brooks called me over and said, look at what we got here. The extended line from the spiral coincides with your following the fault fracture and the concentrated flow. So it's actually telling you the direction in which these things go. So to cut it short now, because it's all in the book, if you read my book on the North American sacred landscapes, this is all explained. So now when you multi-layer these and you combine them, here you have your zigzagging snake images. This is from near Palaki by Sedona near Palaki. You see the snakes crossing there. What that's saying is there's a concentrated flow flowing right along the base of that ledge. And that's always ca often caused by drip flow, flow from precipitation coming off the hills up above, going into the fracture at the base of the cliff and flowing along it. But then you got a Sanagua circle there, shield. And what's that telling you? That's telling you another flow is intersecting that flow at that point and extends out from that ledge. Believe it or not, we've tested it and it works. Other people have adapted this, tested it, and it works. And we've done it reversing it every which way we can to see if we can find anywhere where it fails. And right now it has not failed in any of the sites I've done or any of the people that have been working with me and the people who are working with me throughout the United States and in Canada. So now what happens with astronomy? Now you've got to connect with the upper world, with the spiritual world. What they did is what we're finding. They put the features that they're using for sighting astronomy, like these stone boulders, on concentrated flows, or the petroglyphs or pictographs, on a concentrated flow, and then using something in the horizon to sight on to document Pleiades rising, solstice, winter solstice, summer solstice, or equinox. In this case, I didn't do this, David Gutowski did, as mentioned above. What he did is he found this site, Council Rock, as he called it. I went over there, Dave said, uh, let me take you to Council Rock. We got in the area, parked the car, and I said, how far is it to these rock features? And he says, oh, about a half mile, three quarters of a mile. I said, okay, don't tell me where they are. Let me see if I find them. I'm going to just simply douse for the concentrated flows and see if they can. I can find them along the base of the slope and if they lead me to these rock features. And they did. They led me straight to him. What Dave Gutowski had found when he lined these rocks up, which are on a concentrated flow, they showed winter solstice sunset. But he found that it was off by a little bit. And what he realized that axle precession alignment throws it off over a period of time. So when he worked with some of the astronomers, and they went to the star charts, and this is where Ivy, who spoke the last time that I was on with you, uh, was there. She does this. What they found out, these stones were put in an alignment 3,825 years before present. So we can even use this information to help date these sites back to archaic and even beyond. So based on this research, a similar form of surface mapping exists within the regions we have investigated throughout the United States and several parts of Canada. But it also includes Peru and Chile, and we've also done it in England and France. 
So it not only shows it's not a Native American phenomenon, it is also perhaps a human practice that was done in ancient times that was part of their spiritual beliefs early on. Now, these sites are in North America, South America, are a very important component of the Native American cultural heritage throughout North America, South America, and need to be preserved. Many people just exclude these stone features or don't know about them, especially modern non-native archeologists, and they, they don't recognize them when it comes to uh, areas where they wanna build roads and apartments and expand cities into uh, housing developments. But these are as much a part of the Native American cultural heritage as anything else out there in their archeological past and need to be preserved. And my goal right now, reaching 74 years of age and having done this for so long and having many other people duplicate, replicate this and show that it worked is that I wanna continue doing research on this, but I also want to share this information, meet with people in the field, show them what we have, share our knowledge together, because it's helping us develop a better understanding of these sites beyond where we are today. And it helps the Native Americans preserve these sites as well as sites in other regions. Now, this summer I was hoping to come out west, but I just had a knee replacement two weeks ago. And my knees locked up because of the psoriasis I had and because of another operation. And the doctor said, now we did the, le the right one. That means you're gonna be an inch and a half taller on that side than the left side. So you gotta have the left done. So I was hoping to get out west this summer because I missed last summer, but I don't think I will. But what I wanna do is set up a base and meet as many people as I can. And those who are interested, keep in touch with you. And then when I come back out west, whenever that'll be within the next year, I'm willing to meet with people, meet with groups, meet with chapters, and we can, I'll show you what I do with this, teach you how to do it, and you can test me on it and see for yourselves whether it works or not. And I have currently three books out. The first one, Beneath Nazca Lines, is in a DVD form because it's 850 pages long and extensive on the initial research. And then the Native American Sacred and Ceremonial Landscape is a few hundred pages long, and it's a field guide to what I just described to you. If you get that book, it will assist you in interpreting what I have mentioned, and it covers features throughout the United States and into Canada. And then the third book is how I applied this to the, geo, to the uh, megalith sites of Southern England and Carnac, France. And that is my program. <laughs> well, thank you, David. That was very interesting. Uh, thank sure you. It gives us a lot to look for next time we go out. Thank you. Yeah, like very, very interesting. If you get the books, the, the, the book on North America, I have all the pictures in there of hundreds of pictures of different symbols, features, and it tells you what to look for. But I'm looking forward to hoping you share your emails with me. And then when I do come out in the future here, we can get together and look at some of this stuff together. Questions? Well, I think you uh, answered most of our questions with your your talk. That that was well, extremely interesting. Well, it was fascinating. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. It was fascinating, David. This oh, is what thank you. Was, Remember, was. this isn't this is a new research. I mean, this has been tested and tested and tested, and also the fact that it was tested even by Dennis Stanford from Smithsonian, who. Uh, was the one that put 
support the recommendation that it go into the National Archives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone that has tried this so far said they will never look at these sites the same way again. Mm -hmm. A lot of Native American groups are also using this information because like they're saying, this is helping them fill in the holes of some of the knowledge they lost. Now that's not so true out where you are because a lot of the Native American groups weren't hit so early on. Out here in the East, the Lynn and Appy who I'm working with to save sites along the Hudson Valley, they were hit by the Europeans by 1624. 1650, they were already being driven out of their land. And so they lost a lot of that knowledge. And now using what's left of their oral tradition and what we have here, we're bringing it back together and piecing this all together. Well, that's all fascinating and uh, can't wait to have you come out and join us. and go out and look at some of this stuff. I'm looking forward to it. I just wish I wasn't having these knee operations. I'd be there this <laughs> summer. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's great that we're able to uh, have you be our speaker and we can talk about all of this and share information back and forth. Um, this is great. I'm very happy that you could share with us. Yep. So um, send me your emails if you wish, and I'll keep a list, and I'll keep updating you on what my schedule is and stuff like that with anybody who wants to share that. If you know any other chapters or groups that are interested in having me speak on this, I'm more than willing to do it. Okay, we've got a couple of uh, other people from other chapters. They may get in touch with you. Yep. Good. But uh, yes, I did record it and I'll have that available in the future. Good. So. I hope you cut out where it killed us and went. Back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm able to edit it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> We're really looking forward to having you out here and, and going out in the hills with you because, you know, yeah. we have so many rocks out here and. <laughs> You know, we just look at them as rock shapes most of the time. <laughs> and that's what happens, you know, and I stumbled on this. I didn't ask for this. I wasn't looking for this. Oh. And if I hadn't gotten out of the woods, so to speak, and gone into the bleak desert, I would have never hit this. Because in the Atacama, it's not even like where you are. Yes, if you're in Arizona, you're in a desert, but it isn't the Atacama. When you get in the Atacama, there's no vegetation outside the valley. So everything was exposed and right in your face. And that helped put this all together a lot easier. Yeah. But boy, when we came back into North America and started exploring all the different environments, it's right on. And I tell you, it's amazing what you have in your area. Oh, I imagine. Well, anybody that wants to turn their video on can do so at this time. Uh, so David will uh, put a face to some of the names and, and voices. Yeah. <clears throat> Would you uh, share with us again, please, David, your email? Very so. It should be them? in the email that uh, invited you to this meeting. Oh, OK, Richard, I'll look there. It's easy, though. It's global, D as in David, J as in Johnson, global DJ, only it has nothing to do with me on the radio. <laughs> okay. Global DJ at optonline, O-P-T-O-N-L-I-N-E dot net. Okay, thank you. And if you run across features, you think you see something, send it to me. I'm always glad to look at features, see what you see, and, and give it an idea. And, you know, don't be shy about something. Don't say, oh, I don't know. This is probably silly. Because when that happens, that's when we lose some of the most important information. 
The idea is to bring up anything you've got, look at it, analyze it, and see what it is. And so I don't care how silly you think it is, or maybe it's my imagination. We got to look at it because it's amazing what is out there. I think oh, yeah. most of you never thought of a turtle Karen before. No, no you opened my eyes to a lot of different things on the Karens. Um, just, I've never seen piles of rocks like that and for them to be in walls. Uh, snake shaped, uh, turtle shapes. Uh, to me, that's fascinating. It's it's a brand new idea that I've never thought of. Well, that stone wall that I showed you in south of, it's about 10, 12 miles south of uh, Flagstaff mm -hmm. in Coconino Forest. And Peter, who is the archaeologist for Coconino, after I found that I met with him. Peter Pillis. Yeah, and I showed it to him. And uh, Walter, the guy that works with him, was there. And he looked at that and he says, where the heck is that thing? And I says, about 12 miles south of here. <laughs> and he said, no way. And he looked at Walter and he goes, why the heck didn't you find that? <laughs> and, it, you know, how do we find it? We found it because the year before, I was with a group of people and did what I offered you. And then while I was back east, some of them were out scouring around and one of them found a stone feature and he followed it to another stone feature, followed it to another stone feature. And here he's looking at this 250 foot long snake wall. Mm -hmm. And that's how that was found. Mm -hmm. I know most of us when we're out walking the trails, we're looking down, but uh, <laughs> This just tells us we're going to have to look up once in a while also. Don't yeah. just look at the ground. Yeah. <clears throat> it's amazing what's there. And uh, the combinations of petroglyphs, uh, we don't know everything. <laughs> we're oh, not no. going to know everything. No. <laughs> but what's fascinating is once we put our minds together, and especially when we're out in the field, how we're able to bring it together more quickly. Because everybody's got a sort of a piece of the puzzle. Right. Once we get together and we start brainstorming, all of a sudden that puzzle becomes much more completed. And that's what we've been doing. And, uh, you know, I've worked with several universities on this, archaeologists, geologists, hydrologists, and uh, it's just amazing how far we've come with it. Yeah, there's a lot of mysteries, and uh, uh, some of us are not, uh, not archaeologists, and I think that has given us uh, an advantage. We can see things that archaeologists don't pick up on. They've not, they've not been taught to look for some of these things. That's what I'm laughing because a couple of the biggest finds we had happened that way. Right. Um, one happened in Peru. Um, a guy who was, it turned out to be an Australian miner and I was working in Peru and stationed out of Nazca where all the tourists come through. And he attended a lecture on the Nazca lines and heard about me. and said, I want to meet him, and he talked with me, and he says, I douse, I douse for concentrated flows in the bedrock because I'm an opal miner, and I look for opals. He said, would you want to volunteer for a couple of weeks on, with you? I would be willing to go. <laughs> and so he came, and he ended up finding one of the smallest, most significant geoglyphs we found that entire season. Because we often end up with blinders. Right. Because we're concentrating, following that pattern. And then one of you could come along who are not familiar with our work and say, what's that over there? And then all of a sudden we're going, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> And this happens. And I always encourage 
you know, even people not like yourselves, but all of you have been involved with archaeology to some extent. Whether you're a professional archaeologist or not, you have the interest, you've read about it, you've been out there. But even those who are non were not interested or first time exposure to archaeologists, I'm also interested in even having them because you never know what they're going to say. Oh, yes. Well, we can all learn from uh, other people. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, people will tell you something and they don't even know they told you. Yeah. <clears throat> They've yeah. given you an idea that they didn't even pick up on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And we always work with a consensus. We hash it out and we say, well, you think, you think, you think, you think. And then we come to a common conclusion on it. And uh, working with Native Americans and everyone else, it, it just combines everybody together. Well, this is a fascinating uh, subject, and I'm sure we could all go on forever. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank you again for being our guest and uh, teaching us a lot that we didn't okay. know. Well, thank you for having me, and please let's keep in touch. Send me okay. your emails, and we'll communicate, and I'll give you an update to when I'm coming out, and we can work something out. Okay, sounds great to me. Uh, if nobody else has anything, uh, I'll go ahead and end the meeting here. Bye, see you next so. month. Okay, thank well, you. Again, all right, well, thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, thank you David. Good to meet you all. Thank you. All right, goodbye. Good night.